just can't believe that you're the same guy that sits down the pew from me on Sunday. This isn't church, it's business. The sooner you learn that, the better. A fan is simply defined as an enthusiastic admirer. Sometimes I can't help but wonder if our churches have really become stadiums full of fans. One more, just one more, just one more. (laughs) She wants a divorce. I can't breathe, Eric. Eric! What if I died, Gary? You didn't. What if God's trying to tell me something? Uh, Like what? We had this huge house and all this stuff, and I almost lost my family. Obviously, we need more than this. Excuse me, sir. Do you think you could spare us a little something? Those people are where they are for a reason. All the good intentions in the world can't change that. Jesus said, if you've helped the least of these, you've helped me. To do nothing is not an option. And so Jesus turns to the crowd, and he asks the one question that will ultimately define our lives. Are you a fan or a follower? I don't want people to say that I'm fake. You know what separates the real from the fakes? Love. Good morning, everybody. Welcome here. My name is Jason Clausen. I'm one of the pastors here at the Open Door Church. Uh, If you're just joining us, or if you're for the baby dedication, or if your uh, friends or family dragged you here, just want to welcome you here. We're glad you came. And if you're a regular, then you're always welcome. And uh, and uh, I'm glad to be uh, talking with you today. Uh, That was actually a trailer video for a small group series that uh, is being uh, launched with uh, Dale and Lynn Manical's small group. Um, and being opened up also to other small groups as well. If uh, that's something you're interested in, if you want to pursue more about that, find out more about uh, the difference between a fan and a follower, I'd like to encourage you to sign up for a small group, um, get you plugged in. Um, I'll be talking for the next little while. I'm launching actually a sermon series starting this Sunday on the externally focused church, and I've been saying for the weeks coming up to this, that really get the full impact of what I'm talking about and really the full impact of what it means to be a follower, a true devoted follower of God, part of that journey will probably be getting involved in a small group and getting with a, a smaller group of people and uh, being challenged more, digging in deeper, and, and really trying to find out how what we're talking about on a Sunday applies on the personal level and, and actually how you can engage with that on a day-to-day impersonal level. And so that's really where small groups help kind of bridge that gap between this big gathering and you as an individual in the workplace or at home or with your friends. And so I want to encourage you to consider that small group. Now, what exactly does it mean to be an externally focused church? What what are we talking about? And so for the next six weeks, what I hope to be doing is traveling on you on a journey of who we are as the open door. What is our, our, our internal fiber? What's our nature? What's our heartbeat as the open door church? And, you know, the thing is, There's the the great church of God, and and we could be anywhere in that great church of God. We're just one part of it, you know, but we're one church in our community, and we're one community in Manitoba, and we're just one area in the world. And so so what does it mean to take the gospel and be the open-door church in Morris and surrounding area? And that's what I hope to go through in the next six weeks, and what our role individually is in the church, how we can partner together, and ultimately how God can work through us. So lofty goals. And as this is a six-week series, today I want to introduce what I'm talking about and put some of the ground terms down. So if you leave today with more questions than answers, that's okay. There's more to it, and we'll solve this as we go through, and I, I want to invite you on that journey with me. Now, the Bellevue Built Moral Hotel, Bellevue Built Moral Hotel, that's a wonderful name already, was built in 1897 by a railroad tycoon named Henry Plant. And it, right now, it's located a uh, little west of Tampa Bay on the Florida Panhandle. But at the time, it was located nowhere. You see, Henry Plant had bought a rail line following down the west coast of Florida. He was a railway tycoon. 
and not a whole lot of people were using it because it led to nowhere. It was a speculative rail line. And so he wanted to draw wealthy clientele down his rail line. So he thought, well, what better way than to build a giant, beautiful coastal resort in the warm, humid, buggy area of Florida? But it was his idea. And he would be able to draw that clientele down. As he would draw them, other people would put up secondary businesses to feed off this wealthy clientele. And and he'd have this kind of empire built around the only rail line in western Florida. So the Bellevue Bitmore Hotel has a very, very old history, a very unique history in its place. And so he was also, because there was nothing else down that Florida panhandle area, Kind of the start of that, that whole local building movement, because he didn't have a building supply store that was internationally pulling supplies. So he had to build his hotel with local material. And so he built it out of Florida pine, basically as a timber frame structure, and he had to um, obviously figure out how to do that. And so the Bellevue Bitmore Hotel holds the record right now as the largest occupied wood frame structure in the world. It's just, it's just monstrous. We actually have to have that picture up on the slide. It would be fantastic. It's just a huge, old, sprawling, beautiful resort, over 160 acres of beaches and pool sides and golf courses and hotels and secondary quarters. It's really, 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 really beautiful. It's also really old. You see, here's the thing. I didn't know this, but the kind of pine that grows in an area is called the loblolly pine, and it's got two uses. And the number one use is as a structural building material. So that makes sense. And the number two use was a very big surprise to me. I didn't know this. Um, I've used turpentine before as a solvent, as a cleaner, an industrial aspect. And Here's what I didn't know. You make maple syrup, but well, I knew this part. <laughs> you hammer in a spigot into the maple tree, and you connect all those spigots with pipes and pipettes, and then you, you boil and you filter down the maple syrup that comes out of there, and you make edible, rich-grade maple syrup. Here's the deal. You make turpentine the exact same way, only you make it from loblolly pine trees. You actually hammer in a spigot into a pine tree, and the pine sap that comes out gets filtered through, and it becomes reduced down into turpentine. So here's the deal. You have a 115-year-old hotel made entirely out of tinder dry turpentine-infused lumber. The whole thing, the structure itself, is made out of turpentine-infused lumber. So that's a problem, obviously. And so this is an eclectic old hotel that's been built on. It's hosted the likes of, this is an eclectic group, Margaret Thatcher, Joe DiMaggio, most of the American presidents of the last 115 years. And for several months, it was the rehearsal space of Bob Dylan's Rolling Thunder Review Tour. So just, and Thomas Edison. This is like, this is a, a unique group of people who have spent significant amounts of time there. So, uh, at one point in time in World War II, then the army commandeered it as a service quarter for the military. They were looking for places to house uh, military servicemen while they were training them to send them overseas. And so the army in World War II installed what was at the time a hundreds of thousands of dollar expensive sprinkler system. Basically, there was a sprinkler head in every single room, on the roof, pointing against every wall, through the attic, everywhere. It was just laced with a sprinkler system, which now would be millions of dollars, way ahead of its time. It was a state-of-the-art fire suppressant system. It was beautiful. In the 1990s, the Bellevue Bitmore Hotel was bought out by a new firm who wanted to do some upgrades, and they started testing uh, the sprinkler system, doing a few upgrades to modernize it. And it was only then that they learned something very, very, very interesting. When connecting the sprinkler system, one step had been missed. The coupler that connected the giant sprinkler system to the water main had never been completed. The entire sprinkler system had sat there for over 70 years, completely inoperative. It was beautiful. It was perfect. It was exactly what you needed. There was a sprinkler head in every room. Wherever there might be a fire need, there was a sprinkler head, but it was disconnected from the water source, and it was completely useless. And we have several firemen here, volunteer firemen, and, and Dan's right here. He's a fireman as well. And he'll tell you, a sprinkler system with a perfect water source that's disconnected is pretty entirely useless. I'm thinking. I don't know. Do you disagree with me on that? Yeah, no, pretty well useless. Yeah, yeah, it's good. The open door is a church. We are a church. And we are part of the greater church of God. 
So we get to partake on the great kingdom-building adventure of God. And that means we have exactly one goal, which is to bring the good news of Jesus Christ. That once we had rebelled against God and were enemies of God, but that Jesus came and he bore our sins on the cross, that he died for our sins to make us right with God, to make a way for us to be right with God, that he rose again from the grave, and that we now can be adopted as sons and daughters of the Most High God. That is it. That is our only calling. That is our only reason for existence. That is who we are. That is the gospel. We are called to preach the good news. So why am I talking about the open doors role? Is there some new good news that we have found? Sure hope not. No, I mentioned that I want to talk about who we are as the open door because I want to talk about how we can affect our community because I think for decades, the church, the the large Western church of North America has been a very impressive looking sprinkler system. We have had outposts and depots on every street corner, in every herding community, in every town, everywhere across the entire country, the entire uh, uh, continent of North America. Everywhere. If there is a community... We're in the community as the church. But I feel like we have been very, very, very focused on building better and better and better sprinkler systems. And we, have, we know the, the water source. We know Jesus. We know he's the, the great water that can, that can quench all thirst. And we have this sprinkler system that's built, that's in these communities. But something's not connected. Something's not bringing the water from the water source into the need. Somehow there's this gap. There's this jump. There's this, this separation. The world's on fire. Our community's in pain. There's loneliness. There's anger. There's fatherlessness. There's divorce. There's hurt. There's isolation. Bitterness. Sickness. And we know that Jesus is the living water that can quench that thirst, that can, that can pour that water on that fire and build something new out of this. But too many churches, and for too long, have stood by building better and better sprinkler systems, wondering why we can't connect the timber to the water source, the fire to the water source. And the open door will not be one of those churches. We are going to let our actions speak. We are moving to be a source of healing and strength and reconciliation already. And I want to continue to move as a source of reconciliation and strength and healing in our community. I want to see us be a blessing in the community. If there's pain, I want to be there. If there's hurting, I want us to be there. Not just there, but actively, impressively pouring that water, that true source that we know. Do you remember kindergarten? For some of you, that was a long time ago. For some of you, not so long. Remember show and tell? I always liked show and tell because I liked talking. Other people hated it somewhat. I remember there was this, this incident growing up from, I don't remember when, till, till probably I was grade two or three, the, of the Riverside Cougar or Bobcat or Lynx. It always seemed to change. Nobody seemed to know exactly what it was. There was the myth of the Riverside Cougar. And, and sometimes people would see, like, paw prints in the ground. It was always a partial paw print. It was a little hard to tell what it was. And sometimes they would see a little bit of fur on a tree, and somebody would know that that was cougar fur that had somehow gone off on that tree. And and there's all these little wisps and rumors, and it kind of grew all the time. Nobody ever seemed to see it with multiple people present. It was always when you you always saw it by yourself. It was really weird how that worked. Anyway, one of the girls in my class for show and tell uh, explained how she had seen the Riverside Cougar. It was very interesting. She, uh, she knew its size. She knew the color of its fur, the way it roared, where, it, where its den was. And even this little interesting tidbit, it wasn't a lone male like we'd expected. It was actually a female. Wow, we were learning all sorts of new things. And she'd gotten a picture of it, only somehow she lost it and she, couldn't, she wasn't able to find it. So we'd have to just trust her. Well, we want to see the evidence. We want to see this picture. I mean, surely if you had a picture of the epic, mythical Riverside Cougar, you'd have a picture of it that we could, we could see what this was. We wanted to see the proof. Even in kindergarten, we weren't so stupid that we would trust that without seeing the proof, without seeing the picture. It was all tell. It was no show. 
I don't think it ever happened. I'm pretty confident she never saw it. So here's the deal. We live in a post-Christian age. We live in a post-Christian age. There was a time when people, whether they believed in God or not, they thought that the church in the community was a good thing. There was a stabilizing presence. It was a healthy presence. And we don't live in that age anymore. That age came and went probably several decades ago. It's not the same era anymore. The world wants us out. They want us out of the schools, out of their business, out of their politics, out of their decision-making, away from their children, away from the communities, and removed and gone. The world hates us, to be quite honest. They are opposed to what we believe in, and they stand against us. We don't have a right to speak by virtue of being Christian anymore. There was a time where if you were a Christian, you were given an ear, but we don't have that right to speak anymore. We don't get to tell by virtue of knowing the good news anymore. And there's three things we can do about that. We can whine and complain that nobody listens to us and nobody really understands us and and we can really just whine and complain about it. Number two, we can ignore the problem. We can pretend it doesn't happen, bury our head in the sands, and continue to be seen as irrelevant and continue to be shut out of the greater community. Or I believe there's a third option that we can do what Jesus did. Because he lived in a world that was saturated with religiosity, with rules, with regulations, and with people who reacted to that by really believing in nothing. And somehow he walked into that world and he did something absolutely amazing. He made himself relevant. He made people stand up and wonder what he had to say. He, he got people watching him and then he conducted himself in such a way that they cared about his message. He made himself be heard in a community that didn't want to hear anything. And I think the way he did it is hiding in plain sight. I want to take a look at the gospel here according to Luke. Luke 9, verses 1 and 2. This is Jesus about to release the 12. This is before the the real official church of the New Testament kind of officially launches, but it's a little little trial. He's letting the 12 out to do what he's been talking about, and then he brings them back, and they kind of talk about what happened before Jesus actually leaves. This is kind of a, a little test case, and this is what he tells them before they leave. It says, Jesus, summoning the 12, he gave them power and authority over all the demons and power to heal diseases. Then he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He sent them out. They went out. He didn't bring them together and wait for people to come to them. He sent them out. And what did they do? Proclaim the kingdom, good news. And heal the sick, good deeds. Good news and good deeds. In fact, let's look at it this way. This is This is an Acts talking about God's workmanship. It says, God sent the message to the Israelites, proclaiming the, say it with me, good news. Nope, there you go. Now you can say it with me. He sent the message to the Israelites, proclaiming the, there it is for you, the good news, and healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil, because, or sorry, and he went about doing good. And healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with them. First part was, and the second part was, that was his method. Good news, doing good. good. The good news is what we are called to bring. We are called to, to bring the good news. But nobody will care how much we know until they know how much we care. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear the tell if they don't see the show. We need our good deeds to pave the way for our good news. That's what an externally focused church is all about. Being the good deeds in the community to pave the way for the ultimate good news. See, if we stop at the good deeds, then we're a works-based church. Then we're a community group. We're a very good community group. And that's nice enough, but there's enough community groups. We don't need to be more community groups. But if we just come with the good news, we're very, 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 very easy to shut up. Just don't listen. We need to use our good deeds to pave the way 
for our good news. And this is what I'm going to take the next six weeks to unpack and talk about and wrestle with. And if you're in your small groups, what, uh, we're going to have some questions to go through to help you wrestle with it. How we're going to unpack how to use good news to pave the way for good deeds. When the church rises up and gives of itself, when the people of the open door rise up and give of themselves, when you rise up and give of yourself selflessly and tiredly and tirelessly and consistently in every place to every person in all times, people will wonder why you give. People will see that you care about them. They will know that whatever you say comes out of a place of love because you'll have shown it before you told it. When people see the self-sacrificial love you give, they'll know you're not in it for ulterior motives. You're not in it for their money. You're not in it for their attendance. You're not in it for manipulation. You're in it because you honestly and genuinely love the people of this community and you have a heart for the hurting and you have a passion for the lonely. And when they see that that's where you're coming from, they will listen. Otherwise, we're just a sprinkler system completely disconnected from the water source. We look good on the outside, but we're dead on the inside. And I know we haven't always gotten this right. And I know we won't always get this right. This is hard. But if we forget this, we can easily forget that Jesus never planted a church. He launched the church, but he never planted a church. He never designed a building. He never chose a new pastor. He never outlined a worship style. He didn't prefer contemporary worship or hymns or organs or drums and keyboard or whatever. He didn't actually lay out any instructions about how to do a church service. He said, don't stop meeting together. It's good to meet together. That's as far as he went. He was silent on the nitty-gritty details of doing a church service. Why do you think that was? Considering that for many North American Christians, this is the entirety of their church experience, why don't you think Jesus cared more about what they did in church? I think it's because Jesus didn't think that being the church was about being in church or being part of a church. I think because Jesus thought being the church was by vast majority out there and not in here. And so he modeled and talked and spoke a lot about what to do out there and very little about to do in here because in here was only preparation for what we do out there because being the church is out there and not in here. And that is what an externally focused church ultimately is. It's not about being busy making programs and helping each other out and doing these things in our own little holy huddle here by ourselves. It's about being in the community and helping those who need our help being with the lost sheep. I mean, can we forget that Jesus left the 99 sheep to find the one lost sheep out there? He was the shepherd who wasn't that concerned about the pen. He was concerned about the lost. And he didn't just talk. He didn't just call. He went out and he did something about it. That's part of the good news. Jesus called us to be fishers of men. Fish don't come to the fishermen, at least not to this fisherman. Fishermen have to learn about the fish. They have to know the water temperature and the currents and where the fish are likely to be and then go to where the fish are. I mean, if you sit in the middle of a deep lake, cast shallow, you're probably not going to catch anything. You have to understand where the fish are by, you know, this river head or by, you know, you have to understand what's happening. Then you have to go to them if you hope to catch fish. And I don't want to be part of a church of fishermen who have the biggest, shiniest, newest boat, the best reel, and all the trendiest lures, but no fish. I want to be a part of the church of fishermen who finds fish. Who go to where the fish are who get their hands dirty, who get wet helping, who jump into the river looking, who are totally sold out, 100% committed and passionate about the lost, just like Jesus. You see, the church in Isaiah's time, they had gotten this wrong. Jesus had called them to be salt. They're called to be salt. Have you ever had the uh, um, cap come off your salt shaker and your salt dump on your food? Salt's really wonderful, sprinkled lightly throughout all of the food. It kind of ruins the food when it dumps in a giant clump. If we're salt, and this is all we do, we kind of just ruin the food. 
But when we're out there, sprinkled throughout the whole community, we, we lift everything up. We elevate the flavor. Something amazing happens with salt. And, and the church in Isaiah's time had forgotten this. And they were just, they thought church was about doing church and about the worship and about the singing and about the, and that's all they did. And they forgot the rest of it. And I want, to list, I want you to hear what God says through Isaiah. This is some harsh stuff. Stop bringing useless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons and Sabbaths and the calling of solemn assemblies, I cannot stand iniquity with a festival. I hate your new moons and prescribed festivals. They have become a burden to me. I am tired of putting up with them. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I will refuse to look at you. Even if you offer countless prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. That is a harsh indictment of the church that stays isolated and dead. Wash yourself. Cleanse yourself. Remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do what is good. And what comes next, we cannot, I cannot overstate the importance. This is when God is really, 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 really mad at the, the, the church that is, that is just inward focused and, and useless and dead and dry. When he says, learn to do what is good, what he says next is really important because this is the father heart of the loving God. Seek justice. Correct the oppressor. Defend the rights of the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. God didn't say seek theological accuracy. Correct the music style. Defend the traditions. Plead the denomination's cause. He says seek justice. Correct the oppressor. Defend the rights of the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. All of that is outside the walls of the church at least initially, these are people who are hurting and helpless and vulnerable and marginalized and need somebody to stand up for them. And that needs to be the church. The world is asking, is help coming? And the answer is, yes, we're here. Here we are. The sprinkler system's already installed. We need to connect to the water main and actually bring the water to the people who need the help. Just imagine what it would be like if we all caught this. If when we got out of our seats and out into the community, we lived this. Would that change anything in our community? Would we see healing? Would we see reconciliation? Would we see changed lives? Would we see addiction broken? Would we see fathers rise up in this town? Would we see children who understood how to grow and learn and behave and work with each other? Would we see adults who would learn how to grow and develop and behave with each other? Would we see businesses acting righteously? What would we see? Would it change this town and would it revolutionize the gospel? Would we see the kingdom come in Morris and God's will be done in Morris as it is in heaven? I believe we would. In Luke, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. It's another group that got church really, really, really wrong. They thought it was about them, and they thought it was about power and authority and about exercising control over the community. That's something we're going to talk about next, over the next six weeks, about using our influence as control as a very dangerous, subtle sort of tendency that when we get into the community, when we're on boards and when we're painting fences and when we have influence, to try to use it to manipulate. That's what the Pharisees did. This is what Jesus said to them. Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. And don't start saying to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. See, what the Pharisees were doing is it didn't really matter what they all did. They were children of Abraham, so they were the chosen ones of God. I I think it would be the modern-day equivalent of bragging about which church you go to. I'm part of the open door. I'm good. I'm covered. I'm part of, and I won't name all the other churches, but you know what I'm talking about. This is the church I go to. I'm all good. I'm covered. I'm part of a lineage. My, my parents were Christian or my grandparents, so I think I'm like grandfather clause in there quite literally or something. They, they associated with Abraham. They thought that was good enough. And Jesus says, for I tell you, God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe is ready to strike the root of the trees. 
Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What then shall we do? The crowds were asking him. And Jesus replied to them, look, this is a big problem. This is an inward-focused church. This is a dead church. It produces no fruit. And they're saying, what then should we do? And I can't overestimate how shocking Jesus' response is. It's just not what I would have thought. The one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none, and the one who has food must do the same. Wait, the church is dead and dying? And the one who has two shirts should share one? And the one who has extra food should do the same? That's not about the church. That's about food hampers. That's not the church. Like, surely their, their, their preaching was off. The Pharisees should be fired and they should put in a new preacher. Or surely the way they were worshiping was wrong. Or surely, and Jesus doesn't even talk about it. He doesn't talk about Sabbath morning. He talks about doing good in the community. That was God's answer to a dry and fruitless church. Here's the thing. The open door has for years positioned itself in a wonderful place in the community where we have given self-sacrificially. And I want to see what would happen if we all caught that vision, we rose up, and we doubled down to give of ourselves, to be a blessing to the community. I want us to ask the question, would we be missed if we were gone? If the rapture happened and everyone was taken up to heaven, would we be missed? What would be the size of the hole we leave in the community when we leave? Do people actually see how much we care? Do they actually see the love? Because if I speak because God loved you so much, he sent his son to die for you, and then I don't act like I'd be willing to die for them, then my gospel is a hollow lie. And people will see through it just like that. People's antenna is very sensitive to false, hypocritical, one-dimensional gospel. But when we give of ourselves, when we catch that vision, when we actually get our hands dirty, roll up our sleeves, when, when people are moving and we help them move, simple things like that, when people are hungry and we give them food, when somebody is without a home and we give them a place to stay for a few months, we demonstrate where our heart is, that our heart is with God, pleading the widow's cause, seeking justice, defending the fatherless, Being a protector and a shield and an influence for people who need protection and a shield and influence. In Matthew 21, verses 5, well, the whole, the whole section of Matthew 21, it's the triumphal entry. It's Jesus coming into Jerusalem and everyone's singing Hosanna and Hosanna. And, 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 and it's, it's really, it's, it's Jesus' coming home to Jerusalem party. It's really, it's just a fantastic picture of his second coming and of, of his perfect, perfect dominion on this world. It starts so really interesting. Uh, I'm just going to pick up in verse 5 here. It says, and this is Jesus quoting Isaiah, but tell daughter Zion, look, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And if you read before and after that, there's this long conversation about Jesus picking out this donkey and bringing this donkey and, and how he was going to ride the donkey and that Jesus came riding on a donkey and it goes on and on about this donkey. And a guy can go, what does this have to do with the triumphal entry? The good news Jesus Christ always comes riding on a beast of burden. At the open door, if I could sum up who we are, we want to be the donkey. We want to be the beast of burden, the workhorse, the one who brings Jesus into the community. We are not Jesus. But we can bring Jesus into this community as a beast of burden, as a humble donkey. And when everyone started cheering and yelling Hosanna, it would have been very, 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 very easy for the donkey to think it was about him. It's never about the donkey. It's always about Jesus. And yet it was the donkey that brought Jesus into the community. And so I want to unpack that over the next couple of weeks. And if you uh, want to follow along with with some of what we're doing, Rick Russo and Eric Swanson wrote a wonderful book called The Externally Focused Church. Uh, We couldn't get them in for this Sunday. They'll be available next Sunday and throughout this week. Uh, I highly recommend getting a copy. It goes into much greater detail about some of what we're talking about and how we want to unpack it. Um, But I want to invite you to come with me on this journey. And for starters, this Sunday, what I want to do, kind of prime you for the next couple of weeks, is I want to issue a challenge. We'll start simple. Write it down. Write it somewhere where you can see it. Talk about it with your spouse or your kids or whatever. It's 
It's a simple challenge. Where am I outside of the church? Where am I outside the church? Currently, already, not some new place you could probably go. Where are you? Do you coach a baseball team? Are you in this school? Are you part of a PTA? Are you on a board? Do you go to school? Do you, where are you right now that's not the church? That's not Sunday school. That's not a church thing. Where are you already? We'll start with that. I want to unpack this challenge for the next couple of weeks. And so uh, I'll, I'll give you a warning. It gets harder later on. But for now, it's pretty simple. Where are you? Can you just identify where you are in the community right now already? Where has God already placed you? And so as we go forward in this, I just want to pray for you guys and pray over you that God will begin to soften our hearts as we learn and grow and understand this. I'm going to invite the worship band to come on up and and play and just invite you guys to bow your heads here as well. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you care so much for the lost sheep that you left the 99 to go find it. God, I ask you right now, I beg you, I plead with you, in your name, please grant us all that heart that we care so much for the lost sheep, that we would do anything and everything and risk all to find it. God, I ask you that you show us with clarity where those lost sheep are, and you give us the, the, the heart and the soul and the understanding to, to really grasp your heart to go look for that lost sheep and bring it in. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would not be a people who is more concerned about ourselves and where our, uh, our church services are going or where our, how we look. God, but we'd be a, a church and a people whose concern is where your heart is with the widows and the fatherless and the hurting in this community. God, I pray you'd be opening doors, opening hearts, and opening understanding over the next couple of weeks as we as we pursue what this means and onward for years as you deepen and drive this into our hearts and souls about who we are in the community. I pray all this in your precious name. Amen. When Jason was talking about being connected in the sprinkler system, it reminded me of John 15 where it says, be connected to the vine. And So this isn't about more stressing and striving. This is actually about that connection. Because as we have that connection with Jesus, he naturally, as that love is shed into our hearts, we we just show that love. And the beauty of the connection with him is that, not that it's effortless, but it, it comes with the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And that is so beautiful. And it just takes off that edge of, oh, having to do more, but just resting in just that power of the Holy Spirit as we connect to that sprinkler system. Jesus, you are the vine and we are the branches. Just a beautiful picture as Jason has painted that for us today. Let's stand together. And if you're here and you need um, prayer for anything, I, I encourage you to come and make your way to the front after we've sung the song.